we enter now the second part of this session, of this early morning session, with a talk from Ramo Raymond Prats, and who will be giving a talk about distribution of POPs in air and water from remote high mountain lakes in the Pyrenees. So the floor is yours. Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is Raymond Martinez Prats. Today I'll be talking about persistent organic pollutants in high mountain areas and their distribution between uh, environmental compartments. Okay, so a bit of background to start things off. Feminization and oxidative stress effects have been observed in fish not only from heavily polluted rivers but also from high mountain lakes. And in some cases, these effects have been linked to the long range atmospheric transport of pollutants. This long range transport is the main cause for a global diffuse distribution of pollutants on Earth, which poses a high ecotoxicological risk uh, associated with the toxicity and potential for bioaccumulation of certain compounds. That's why we study the occurrence, the concentration, and distribution of these compounds. In, uh, in remote areas such as high mountain lakes, away from any local sources of contamination. So we did that here in the National Park of Aguastortas and in Vaidaran in the Catalan Pyrenees. We studied six high mountain lakes encompassing altitudes between 1,600 and 2,500 meters above sea level. These are areas of difficult access, as you can see. So a different approach is needed for obtaining samples. Uh, bringing active sampling equipment to these locations is neither cost nor effort effective. So we resorted to passive sampling techniques. Uh, since passive sampling is not such a well-known method for obtaining samples, uh, some of you may know it, but uh, I, will, I would like to explain it a bit further by introducing to you my quick uh, crash course on passive sampling. I'll, I promise it will be quick. So this is a representation of a high mountain lake with several of its environmental compartments such as air, water, sediment, biota, etc. We already established that compounds reach these areas through long-range atmospheric transport of, and once there, they, several exchanges are established between these compartments or these phases, each with their own equilibrium conditions which further helps these compounds distribute be in once in the system. Think of it as a box diagram where each empty box represents one environmental compartment, one that's pristine and non-polluted. But once these compounds reach the system, in our case through the air, they, they will begin to leak into other compartments and they will continue to do so until an equilibrium is reached if it is rich, which doesn't always happen. So knowing that, what can we do to determine what's happening in our system? Well, we could sample each of these compartments individually in a traditional way, but as I said, that's uh, usually not an option in remote areas if you don't want to spend a lot of money and resources. But what we could do is introduce passive samplers into those compartments we're interested in. What we're effectively doing is adding a new compartment to the system, one for which we know its equilibrium conditions. What will happen is compounds will begin to enter this new compartment, just like with the others, and through equilibrium calculations, we can end up determining indirectly concentrations in other compartments, ones that were previously unknown or difficult to obtain directly. So that's what we did. In the air and water compartments of our lakes, we used polyurethane foam disks and low-density polyethylene strips that we deployed over several months at a time. The, the uptake of pollutants of these passive samplers is, depends on partition coefficients, which are based on solubility ratios between phases, and is driven by a gradient in chemical activity. But kinetics such as uh, flow, turbulence, temperature, wind speed, etc., play a massive role, have a huge influence on these uptake rates. 
that's why we need to account for that. We cannot just assume that all passive samplers are sampling the same amounts of air or water in different locations at the same time. So to account for that, what we do is we calibrate the passive samplers using what we call performance reference compounds, or PRCs. These are a set of standard compounds uh, that span a range of physical chemical properties that we inject into the samplers uh, before deployment. So each dot up here represents one compound that we inject into this passive sampler. And as, we, as it is deployed, it will begin to deplete from the passive sampler. It will be released into the environment. And once we collect the sampler and we analyze these compounds, what we can do is feed a curve to these data points using these equations, which will ultimately give us the effective sampled volumes that will allow us to report concentrations instead of just amounts. So the analysis is nothing uh, to be afraid of. It's not complicated. It only, it only requires a succulent extraction, minimal cleanup, and maybe uh, fraction action of the extract uh, to, depending on the analysis that we want to perform, be it by uh, GCMS, GCMS, MS, or we can also perform an, an HPLC fractionation step if we want to analyze families of compounds individually uh, today I'll be showing you some example results from three main families of compounds. These are polychlorinated biophenyls and other organochlorine compounds, which are a family of uh, legacy pollutants that are no longer produced. Also, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, which originate from the incomplete combustion of uh, organic matter. And also OPFRs, which are organophosphate flame retardants that are a non-regulated um, uh, family of compounds of emerging uh, pollutants. So these are concentrations in the gas phase of air. I will not stop to discuss them individually or their distributions between lakes because that's a talk for another day. But for now, just I, would, I just want you to see that concentrations are generally in the low to mid picogram per cubic meter of air, which is pretty low. Maybe some other compounds, like uh, a couple PAHs, have higher concentrations than that, but that's normal for uh, some of these compounds. So in general, low concentrations, which is to be expected in, in uh, remote locations. But in a couple slides, I'll be talking about distributions and fluxes. And for you to understand that a bit more, I would like to stop here and highlight a couple compounds that will exemplify how that works. So on one case, we have uh, TPHP, which is triphenylphosphate. Uh, this is an OPFR that we found in one of the lakes at much, much higher concentrations than the other ones. We ended up uh, determining that this was due to a local contamination in the sampling site that we didn't account for at the beginning. But uh, just bear in mind that this will help you understand how the flux thing works later. On uh, another hand, uh, this other compound that I want you to look at is retin, which is a PAH that in air was found at pretty low concentrations, uh, especially compared to other PAHs. So not much to be said here, but it will make it, it will make sense in a minute. In the case of water, again, uh, low to mid picogram per liter concentration ranges. Maybe some OPFRs uh, end up showing up at almost nanogram per cubic meter, which is a bit concerning, uh, but that's not the focus of today. The two compounds that I showed you before, again, in this case, triphenylphosphate here in water, it's not, you cannot, you cannot see it here, not because it's not there, but because it's at a much lower concentration than the other OPFRs. So that one lake where we found it in air, uh, we don't find it in water. And the other compound is retin, which it has its own graph down here. In this case, in water, we, ha we found it at very high concentrations, but only in three of the six lakes we studied. We think this might be because uh, retin can be generated through diagenetic processes in eutrophic lakes that have catchments with uh, 
high levels of vegetation, a lot of sediment on the lakes. So generally the lowest lakes, not the uh, highest ones. And that's what happened here. The three lowest lakes with more vegetation and more sediment happen to have much more routine than the other ones. So uh, now we have concentrations in air and in water for several compounds. And what can we do with that? So we can take a look at their distributions between compartments and calculate fluxes from one to the other. These fluxes are derived from mathematical models that um, account for several physical chemical variables of the compounds as well as environmental and meteorological data from the sampling periods. Being in remote locations such as high mountains, we would expect neck deposition fluxes, that is from air to water, because as we already said, compounds reach these locations through the air and are deposited into the lakes, not the other way around. This is what the model looks like. I will obviously not stop here to discuss it. Uh, I just want you to know that all these equations take several variables such as uh, wind speed, temperature, Henry's law constants, molecular volumes, uh, molecular masses, etc. And it uses them to calculate molecular diffusivities both in air and in water, which will ultimately give us mass transfer velocities and uh, mass transfer fluxes. If the flux is positive, that indicates net volatilization, that is from water to air. And it, if the flux is negative, that indicates net deposition from air to water. These calculations obviously have their own uncertainties, in some cases uh, bigger than we would like them to be, but they have been calculated and accounted for, as you can see up here, top right corner, and they are represented in these charts by the whiskers that go up and down each data point. So these are just a few examples of some compounds for which we have calculated the fluxes. Most of them, as you can see below the red line, that's the zero line, that means deposition fluxes as we expected. Some others, like most uh, uh, locations for triphenylphosphate, seem to be around equilibrium. And then some other cases, uh, for example, hexachlorobenzene in the middle, which seems to indicate uh, volatilization fluxes for some locations. This can have several explanations. Uh, one of them maybe could be that hexachlorobenzene is a legacy uh, pollutant in some cases and it has been accumulating in lakes for decades and now that it's not produced anymore for the general part is beginning to release from lakes but that could also be said for other compounds such as PCBs and we don't necessarily observe that in those compounds so we might have to take a deeper look into that but remember those two compounds that I showed you before. So let's see what's happening to them here. On one hand, triphenylphosphate here, remember how we found it in air in one of the lakes at a much higher concentration. We see that translated to fluxes as well. So for that lake, fluxes, deposition fluxes are much higher in that lake than in uh, the other ones, which are near equilibrium. We cannot extrapolate this to the whole lake because, as we said, this is a local contamination that we found in that sampling area. But it's still nice to see how uh, these calculations end up showing you what's happening in theory. The other compound, retin, again, those three lakes where we found the compound in water are the much higher concentrations. We also see that in, in these charts where these three lower lakes uh, show instead of deposition, they show volatilization fluxes because concentrations in water were much, much higher than what they should have been if they were in equilibrium. So we could stay here all day long, but we don't have much time. So just bear in mind that most compounds were found to be either in equilibrium conditions or to have deposition fluxes, which is what we hypothesized, except for those that I already pointed out, which were the main exceptions. Uh, however, I must warn you that these models, specifically this one, uh, do not take into account all the compartments of the system, such as the air and water gas, uh, such as the air and water uh, particulate phases, which definitely play a role or have an influence on distribution of these compounds in, in these systems. Another message of warning is that 
this model uh, uses several values and variables that have their own uncertainties and they can keep piling up so tracking them is of uh, vital importance here. There's also several ways and equations for calculating variables. Uh, we can choose different methods to do that. For example, there's different ways of correcting uh, Henry's law constants with temperature. There's different equations and models to determine the influence of wind speed on air transfer velocities, et cetera, et cetera. So just, we just need to be careful of, on how we interpret these results. We cannot assume that one thing is right or the other is wrong. So that's why, uh, and this will close my presentation, that's why it's always a good idea to remember what George Box, uh, he was a British statistician, he once wrote that essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we just need to uh, be able to see when they can be of any use to us and we don't have to fall for their intricacies. And that's all from me for now. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Is there any question? I would like to know if you could relate some physical chemical properties of the compounds or with the, if they have more the, like volatilization or the possession fluxes? Yeah, so generally, um, well, for starters, with passive samplers, we only uh, are able to find mainly those compounds that have the right properties to be found in these specific phases. We're talking about uh, gas phase and truly dissolved phases of water. So most compounds that would be found in particular phases, we already cannot detect using these techniques in most cases. So that's one thing. Then some uh, more volatile compounds uh, are a bit have too high uncertainties to be adequately um, quantified. And then as for fluxes, yeah, mo uh, it's difficult to say because it's not, the conditions at the beginning are not equal for all compounds, so most of them are found maybe around equilibrium. Some others, yeah, maybe the most volatile ones kind of show more uh, deposition fluxes, higher deposition fluxes than others that uh, may be less volatile and are already in equilibrium. So yeah, we kind of, we still have to study that, but yeah, there's definitely trends. These trends also show in some cases in distributions between lakes uh, at different temperatures, different altitudes. Hi everyone, welcome again to the Young Research Week of here of IDEA 2020. We are going to start the fifth session of the, of the oral presentation with Miriam Perezkova that is going to talk to us about the two-dimensional chromatography in lipidomics. Well, hello, it's Miriam from the Chemometry Group and my advisors are Joachim Jaumot and Ruma Tauler. And mainly today what I'm going to talk is about Thirafish embryos that were exposed to two endocrine chemicals, endocrine disruptive chemicals, bisphenol A and estradiol. I extracted the lipids and then I analyzed by a novel technique of two dimensional liquid chromatography coupled to high resolution mass spec. And the goal of this study was to do a lipidomic approach to study the lipid pathways affected by these compounds. So let's go for it. First, I'll talk a bit about why 2DLC is such a powerful technique in lipidomics. Then I'll talk about the method itself, the experimental design, the results that I've got so far, and I'll end up with some conclusions. But first, let me introduce who are the characters of my presentation today. So they're lipids. Very important biological molecules related with energy storage, signaling, and a structural function. Among omic sciences, lipidomics is a branch that belongs to metabolomics that study the lipids. 
But which lipids? The lipids that have suffered changes when we compare control samples versus exposed ones. And this exposure can be to any stressing agent we can think of. So one of the main advantages of lipidomics is that we can study the immediate effects, so really close to the phenotype. Till now, the main analytical technique used in lipidomics has been LCMS, but we're moving to more complex samples, biological matrices, and then we're seeing that one separation is not enough. So we're moving to multidimensional approaches, adding an extra separation to the, an extra dimension to the separation. This can be through combination of LCMS with ion mobility or with supercritical fluid chromatography or even to DLC, as in my case. So how do I do it? First of all, I want to point out that from all the types of 2DLC, I'm just focusing today on comprehensive mode. It means all the fractions that are coming out from the first column are also analyzed in the second column using complementary retention mechanisms. This is my typical output that I get from 2DLC. And we see that analytes, they are not longer a peak. Now they're spots distributed in the 2D space. From all the retention mechanisms I could use, I'm focusing on the combination of these two. And this is because on the one hand, river phase, or RP, separates by the length of its chains and the number and position of the double bonds, so the hydrophobic part of the molecule. And then with helic, we can separate by the polar head groups. So if we put first helic and then RP, we separate by the families and then a quick screening discriminating between the, the hydrophobic parts. But we can also do it the other way around. And so the longest separation is by the hydrophobic part and then a quick screening discriminating between families. Working with 2DLC is quite complex, but if it was easy, then it wouldn't be a PhD. So I've uh, classified the problems I've encountered in two main groups. So the experimental ones and the ones related with data treatment. So first, I had to encounter long analysis times, normally up to two hours, so quite long. Also reduced sensitivity due to the fact that I'm using two columns, so my sample is diluting in both. And also co incompatibility issues when I mix mobile faces from both columns. For solving that, I use a really new strategy for the first time ever applied in lipids, which is ASM, so active solvent modulation. It mainly is a bypass capillary that dilutes the first mobile phase before it enters in the second dimension column. This way, we improve solvent compatibility, so I can take higher fractions from the first column to analyze them in the second column. It means I can reduce the total analysis time and at the same time, increase sensitivity, so perfect. This is the, the 2DLC method I developed during my research day in the US and I decided to go for RP helic. So first dimension C18, second dimension silica column, as mass spec I use a cutoff, and my total analysis time was just two hours, which is quite reasonable if we compare with other previous study for lipids found in the literature. So this is my final chromatogram from my lipid standards, and as you can see, the different lipid families are distributed in the 2D space. But well, once I've collected my data, then I needed to treat them. And it was not as straightforward at all as compared with one DLC because these data sets were huge and complex. Also, I didn't have online platform for direct analysis such as if they're very common used in, meta in metabolomics such as XCMS. And also my data were vendor software, vendor dependent software. So I needed to create my own strategy. And so I used to usually say divide and conquer. So I had a huge problem and I uh, divided into smaller pieces I can deal with. First of all, I did data compression. So from 10 gigas, I just got one. It was still huge, but manageable. Then I did some data rearrangement to analyze several samples at a time. After I applied regions of interest strategy, which is mainly setting an uh, intensity threshold and just keeping the most important m set values upon this threshold. And also I did a semi-target analysis, focusing on a list of lipids I knew they were present in zebra fish embryos, reducing complexity. Then I applied multivariate analysis and the biological interpretation of the results. 
let's go back to my zebra fish embryos. So we see now, normally, therapies embryos are used in toxicology to assess the effects of new pharmaceuticals or emerging pollutants. In my case, I'm working with uh, endocrine disruptors that slow down lipid absorption. This is my normal pipeline when I work with zebra fish embryos. I start my eggs, my, so I collect them my eggs at day, I start day post fertilization, then I put them into blades at day one. I start exposure at day two. And then in this case, I collected my embryos at days four and six because they were critical stage of your sac reabsorption. But as opposed to what? Well, I already made you a spoiler. And yes, to bisphenol A, which is the bad guy of this story. But you can tell me, okay, Miriam, but BPA is already banned or is strictly limited in uh, a lot of uh, products like um, baby bottles or package related with food stuff. And yes, but did you know that it wasn't until this year that the regulation in thermal paper was applied? And you can tell me, well, what is thermal paper? So it's the one that we get from any ticket in the supermarket or shop. So it's in our daily lives. So it means bisphenol A is still present in the environment. For example, in surface waters, it can be to up to 50 ppbs. And it is an endocrine disruptive chemical, as I said. Among all the effects it can cause, I'm focusing just on the estrogenic effect that is related to reproduction and obesity. The goal of this study was to characterize the BPA effect, the estrogenic part and the obesogenic part. And for doing that, I compared the embryos exposed to bisphenol A to embryos exposed to a natural estrogenic hormone, estradiol, to be our control, estrogenic control. And then with the differences, I could see what was beyond this estrogenic effect, the non-estrogenic pathways altered, and for that, I needed lipidomics. These are the concentrations levels that I tested, and I chosen to be comparable with our previous study done in their group, and also to ensure I was working under sublethal doses. Let's talk a bit about the results. I've structured to talk about the um, statistics I've done, how my data look like, and then um, which were the lipids affected by this exposure. Let's start with the statistical results. First, ASCA, ANOVA Simultaneous Component Analysis, which helped me to assess the effects induced by different factors of the experimental design. In my case, my experimental factors were treatment, BPA or E2, collection day, four or six, and then concentrations levels ranging from control samples to high exposure samples. If we look at individual factors, then we see that they resulted significant and treatment was almost significant. So if we look at two ways interaction, then we see that treatments and day are significant both, which is in agreement. But for having a clear effect of the concentration, it was better to divide it by days and then by pairs of concentrations levels. So control versus high versus medium versus low. Let's have a look. At day four, for BPA, it was just significant control versus high and the rest of them, no. But if we look at day six, then we start to see that for both treatments, BPA and estradiol, for control versus high and control versus medium, we can see that the results they were significant, but not control versus low as expected because it was chosen to be a really low concentration with no uh, visual effects. PCA, or principal component analysis, help us to visualize our data. In this case, this is a PCA of all the treatments, all concentrations, and all days, everything. If we have a closer look here, then we see that the exposures at day four for both treatments and control samples are clustered together. Whereas if we look here, we can clearly identify BPA exposure at day six and estradiol exposure at the same day. Let's have a look at day four. So we see here estradiol and control samples are clustered together, whereas BPA exposure is clustered separately. And then it is very interesting because we see here a trend from low exposure to high exposure. If we look at day six, then now we can clearly see 
on control samples, BPA exposure, and E2 exposure separating. The same trend is observed from low to high for BPA, but also for estradiol. PLSDA, or partial least score discriminant analysis, was very, very useful for identifying the lipids that have suffered changes due to the exposure. And this is done through the VIPs, the variables important in projection, that can be easily associated with NSAID values. So these are the total numbers of VIPs obtained for the most significant treatments on day. But let's have a look at Venn diagrams. So here, for example, we compare BPA, controls versus high, for the both days. And we see we've got 37 lipids in common from these families. But also it's important to uh, analyze in closer detail the lipids that are specific for each day. But it's even more interesting in the case of comparing BPA versus E2, which was one of the main goals of this study. Uh, for example, for controls versus high at day six, we find 70, say 60 lipids in common from these families. And also it is very uh, interesting to look at the ones specific for each treatment. This is a heat map that includes uh, all days, so four and six, and then concentrations levels ranging from control samples to high exposure samples, and then alternating uh, estradiol or bisphenol A. And if we look here, when we increase the day and the concentration levels, we see how more lipids are being affected by the exposure as expected. Through full change, we can see that as we expected, as uh, these uh, endocrine disruptors have slowed down lipid absorption, we see the majority of the triacylglycerides and phosphatidylcholines increase their relative concentrations at day six for both treatments. Then if we look at the acyl glycerides and lysophosphatidylcholines, they suffer a decrease at the highest exposures, and minor effects were fine for sphingomyelins. These are just some examples of lipid species identified through the BIPs for the most significant treatments, so BPA at day six, at day four, and E2 at day six. But this is still work in progress. Uh, there were just a few examples, but there are many more, and I'm looking at in a closer detail the differences between BPA exposure and estradiol so we can really characterize the BPA effect, which is the main goal of this work. So I can say, uh, we confirmed some previous results about our bad guy here, about the BPA exposure that we see that minor effects were found in energy-related lipids, so triacylglycerides, acylglycerides, and in the case of three of these embryos, we can include here phosphatidylcholines and lysophosphatidylcholines. And also minor effects were found in structural lipids, so sphingomyelins. So take home messages. Uh, from an analytical point of view, I develop a 2DLC method for lipids and also a data analysis strategy to deal with these huge and complex data sets. From the environmental and biological point of view, I found obesogenic effect for both treatments, which was kind of unexpected. So I'm, closing in, I'm looking in a closer look at the differences between these two. And about the, the treatments that resulted significant, I can say they were for both treatments, so BPA and E2 at day six, the highest concentrations tested. So just for ending, I wanted to thank my chemometry group, the collaboration with the Environmental Toxicology Group in IDAEA, and my collaboration during my research day in the US, and all of you for your attention. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much for your ni very nice presentation. So, there, there are some questions in the room. We are going to see if there are some questions in the Facebook. No? So, I have a question for myself. Um, the, you said that you use the reverse phase and the helix, and how did you decide that the order or the columns, did you make some trials or something? Yeah, sure. During my research day, I did a lot of testing in both combinations possible, so helic RP and RP helic. 
and then I found out that it was better to put RP first because of the the longest separation was according to the hydrophobic part of the molecule, and then it was easy just to discriminate between families, because if I do, did it the other way around, then the second dimension that is the shortest is not able to really separate uh, different lipids, and I needed more advanced chemometric strategies. And also, uh, there are some um, paper published about that recently, also in Therafish embryos. They were really interesting, and they were proving the same results that I found out during my research day. So for this specific application of lipids in untarget um, separation, it was better to go for RP helix instead. So. <laughs> Thank you. Some other questions? So thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, we are going to progress to the next presentation. It will be performed by Rodman Criollo. That he's going to talk about an approach to shallow geothermal exploitation. Thank you. Well, um, there is the yeah, thank you for joining us in, in this uh, week of research in, in IDEA. I'm Rodman Criollo, and I will explain a little bit the work done from, uh, related with shallow geothermal exploitation. Um, oh. Okay, so... Um, with the population growth, uh, it's uh, increasing the energy consumption. consumption. So, but um, along the years, from the 90s to the present, the, the, the distribution of this energy consumption is still more or less the same. So uh, related with residential energy consumption is close to 25%. But uh, this energy consumption in households is... Uh, uh, the main energy consumption is related with uh, space heating and space cooling close together. So um, it's well known all the uh, energy resources for, for this uh, consumption is uh, fossil fuels, uh, biomass, uh, nuclear waste, and renewable oil. But now we have to reduce the, the CO2 levels and the gas emissions and um, to manage in a proper way the, the residuals done for nuclear, nuclear energy plants. So uh, focusing on renewable energy, uh, the European Union is uh, pushing for a uh, using of shallow geothermal energy uh, to, um, uh, to face with this, uh, oh, sorry, to face with this uh, heat and cooling energy demand. But what is uh, shallow geothermal energy? It's, uh, it's uh, the, inter the inter exchange of energy between the subsoil and the, uh, and the building to uh, the air conditioning. So they are the, um, mainly two systems. The open system uh, can uh, pump not only the, the energy, but also the, the water that can be, uh, that may reduce the, the water levels of the of the of our aquifers and the other system is uh, to um, only uh, exchange energy from the subsoil so this is the the most uh, system that is installed nowadays and um, we we address one one of these installations in in Barcelona that is close to Spain square and um, they are uh, building a new um, new administrative building, and the objective is uh, designed um, uh, is to f to to meet the, the energy demand of this energy uh, of this building using this this uh, closed system of uh, geothermal energy. So the previous design, when they 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 did the, they made the, the, the project, is uh, to cover the monthly demand with 80 borehole head exchangers, 80 of these each uh, in, in, uh, exchangers, with, uh, with this, this cycle along the year. 
So uh, it's, it's common to use uh, so, some softwares that doesn't have into account the groundwater flow. So this is really relevant for the exchange of energy in the subsoil. That's so. Uh, the motivation of our work is uh, to see what could be the, the effects downstream after the long period of exploitation of these uh, geothermal systems and to, um, to uh, address what is the, 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 the proper design of these, uh, of these uh, systems and to, to see what is the, uh, the, the power requirements of, the, of, of, these, uh, of these systems as well. So we, will, we want to understand the possible impacts of the, in the subsoil and to evaluate the efficiency of these uh, geothermal system designs. Um, the, the hydrogeological context, we have a geology with intercalation of uh, clay, gravel, and sand uh, units. And on the bottom, we, we found uh, some uh, big uh, units of, of loams. The, the groundwater levels uh, goes from the northwest to the southwest, uh, northeast to the southwest. Sorry, and uh, this is the, the 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 zone where this uh, building is will be will be constructed. And uh, as we can see, more along the years, the the piezometric levels are more or less the static. They don't have uh, big big uh, uh, changes. So the geothermal properties was uh, compiled for uh, all the studies, all the studies done in the zone, and um, and uh, during the, the the project was done some um, some thermal um, response test to obtain the con the thermal conductivity and the head capacity of the of the of the zone. So to, to understand what is the behavior of these uh, systems together with the, with the groundwater system, we perform a groundwater flow numerical model coupled with borehole head exchangers in fee flow. This is the distribution of the 18 head exchangers that the, the builder wants to construct in this, uh, in this area. There are uh, three, there are, there are five of observation points, and um, we we evaluate what could be the the, the, the optimal uh, distribution of this uh, uh, the the pipe out and the pipe in of of, of water in each uh, head exchanger. So this is the results of the numerical model in ten years of simulation. Here there is the contour map of uh, of temperature distribution. The, temperature, the initial temperature was uh, 20 degrees in the subsurface. As you can see, in 10 years, the thermal plume arrived close to 30 meters, 300 meters downstream, downstream of, the, of the building. So uh, if we, do, we did a zoom around the, the boreholes, and we can see the interaction between the, the thermal plumes of each of these uh, uh, head exchangers. And, and this, uh, and looking for the temperature along the years, we can see the distribution of this temperature goes uh, below, go, goes low, low. Sorry. So the efficiency of the of this system will be reduced along the years because the interaction between each of these uh, heat exchangers. As you can see in the profile. The main, the main term, the, the long thermal plume is in the in the zone with more permeability. So this uh, this water flux increases the efficiency of the system. While we, we, if we go down, the the, the thermal energy in the inter, the, inter, the exchange of energy is uh, is more or less constant. Um, looking for the efficiency of this uh, geothermal uh, system, if uh, having into account the groundwater, we can see for each cycle the, the efficiency is increasing with the, the initial design in, that is, is, is in blue. 
So uh, the, the, uh, the power that we can extract from the subsurface is increasing if we happen to account the one water flux. But at the same time, as we can see here, the thermal plume is, is a mainly issue that we have to address when we design this, this kind of systems. So as conclusions and remarks for this work is um, that we have to be aware of the design of these uh, of these geothermal systems, not only for the the increasing efficiency it's having into account the groundwater flux, but also because the the problems that can be done in downstream of the of the systems. So it required to improve the design of the system, to improve the energy exchange cycle along the years, and uh, to monitorize this term possible thermal plume. And thank you for 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 your uh, thank you for your uh, for your attention, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for your very nice presentation. There is some question in the room. I have maybe it's just a curiosity uh, because I'm not, I don't know so much about this. Uh, do you um, do you think that um, after some years, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years, the 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 efficiency of the thermal exchangers? You say that um, it um, it decreases like in 10 years, do you think that it will continue to decrease or it could be like stabilized a bit? Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, um, we saw that in, in 20 years, this, um, this reducing uh, exchange of, ten of energy is more or less stabilized, but it still is uh, reducing. Yeah, but this is a... Um, this is a main issue because you invest a lot of money to to implement these systems, and uh, the the first uh, the first years you you can um, um, win a lot of uh, efficiency, but in ten years you can see that that the the the, the production of energy is reduced. So it's uh, it's it's required to understand what is the behavior of the of the groundwater system before you start to design this this system. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. There is there is some question in the in the public. Um, yeah, the question is, uh, we've seen the interaction between um, the, the heat exchangers in, let's say, one exploitation. What about the interaction between different exploitations? We've seen the plume has 300 meters expectation. Uh, is there any mm, managed policy in the city or...? Yeah, yeah this is a, a relevant question because um, if you can see here um, the thermal plume, there is uh, uh, we, design, we we simulate a, a single uh, geothermal exploitation. But what happens if there is another one here? You can reduce a lot the efficiency of the of the neighbor uh, geothermal system. So nowadays there is a, there is a regulations in Europe that is uh, collected for in Spain. But they don't have into account the groundwater systems. Uh, the groundwater, yeah. So they, they only uh, focus on the convection. So it, they don't have into account the advection and dispersion of groundwater. So it's really relevant for the, for the behavior of all the geothermal systems in, in, in an area. Yeah. Thank you. We have other question by Ashkan in the Facebook Live. He's asking about uh, how deep are the, bar, uh, the boreholes usually? How deep? How deep? Like uh, ho um, ah, 10 meters, 20, yeah, the boreholes. Yeah, this is uh, 
one one of the things that uh, that uh, we we do for the different designs. I, I didn't show the different designs that we simulate, but this is the the original design for the builder. But uh, in general, most of the constructor constructor uh, do uh, 120 meters deep by standard because they have all the installation uh, designed for this uh, deep. So if you can reduce the number of, of head exchangers or reduce the, the deep of these head exchangers because if you, you can see here that most of the efficiency on a head exchanger are, are done in the, in the first tens of meters because the permeability is, is more higher than the, the deep zone. Thank you so much. Some more questions? Thank you so much, Roman. We are going to move to the next presenter. We are going to continue with the sixth session of today with Berta Sala that is going to talk to us about plasticizers in turtles. Good morning, everyone. I'm Berto. I'm doing the PhD here in the Enfocan group. And I'm talking about uh, OPE's um, plasticizers in loggerhead sea turtles from Balearic and Catalan coast, the impact of diet and plastic marine litter. This is the part of, of my talk. To introduce the, um, the topic, uh, everybody knows that the, the plastic pollution is a, a big problem for the environment. And only in 2018, more than 350 million tons of plastics were produced. And a lot of these plastics are in, on the sea. Um, but the problem, it's not only the, the, cru uh, the um, crude oil, because the plastics that, that have um, additives, and one of, of these additives is uh, organophosphate ethers. This kind of plasticizer is also a flame retardant, and we can find this in furnitures, uh, in construction, in textile in industries, and also in electronic device. These compounds um, start to use in the uh, 1960s, but in um, 2010, the PBDs uh, were banned by the Stockholm Convention, and the uh, OPEs um, were uh, increased uh, their use. Um, it's important to, to mention that these compounds are toxic, and they can be uh, neurotoxic effects. They can be um, disruption uh, endocrines and also carcinogenics. Sorry. The, the purpose of this study is evaluate the, chem the chemical impact of marine plastic debris in, in sea turtles, the careta careta, by the, the determination of OPE's levels in muscle of, of these samples. Uh, these samples are collected in Catalan and Balearic coast and try to find the sources of, of these contaminants, uh, evaluating uh, both the turtles, the, the prey, and also the, the plastic litters. Um, 20 uh, turtle samples were collected in, in Catalan coast and 22 in Balearic coast from, of Careta Careta. During 2014 until 2017 for CREAF. Um, for the prey samples, we did uh, different pools for uh, uh, five individuals of a sardine, um, jellyfish, and a squid. These are only of the Balearic um, um, coast. And the um, plastic samples uh, were collected also in Balearic uh, um, Sea, uh, Balearic Islands, I'm sorry. And we had uh, samples of plastic bottle caps, plastic bags, plastic gear sticks, and also fishing nets. How we prepare these, these samples? Um, we, um, 
We freeze dry the, the samples and we took uh, 0 0.5 grams uh, of dry weight. Uh, we put 15 uh, milliliters of acetonic xan 11 and uh, we do an uh, ultrasonic bath during 15 minutes. After that, we do the centrifugation during 20 minutes and we repeat all this process uh, until to have uh, 13 uh, milliliters. We evaporate under a purified nitrogen stream and uh, we change the, the solve. We put exan methanol 1,3 and we took only 200 microliters and we do the instrument analysis with the LC MSMS. For the plastic uh, samples, the process is really similar, but we change the solvent. In this case, we use uh, uh, ethyl acetate, and also we do the analysis instrument uh, with the, the same the same LCM SMS. Um, to the results and, and discussions uh, in this table, uh, we summarize the. Um, the results of Catalan coast and Balearic coast of, of the turtles. And we see the minimum, maximums, mean, median, and detection frequency of the, the compounds. Um, we can see that in, sorry, in the both uh, areas, the minimum um, compound is TPP, and the maximum for Catalan coast is 2APPDPP. And for Valeric Coast is TEP with a, a value of 42.5 uh, nanograms grams wet, wet weight. Okay, uh, here we can see the comparison between also the, the turtles from two areas. Uh, and here we can see that the, the, it seems that the Balearic coast are, have a higher uh, concentration and, and, and to, 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 to see that we did uh, different statistical um, studies and when we did that we saw that the, the difference is not uh, significant, it's not significant um, but the um, the mean of, of Balearic coast is, is higher than, than Catalan ones. Um, if we see the, um, the um, detection uh, frequency of Catalan coast, we see that the, the most common compound is DCP, uh, followed by TP, TPP01 for IPP, DPP. And in the case of Balearic coast are the same, uh, less the, the last one. For the, the concentrations, uh, for the opus total concentrations, we can see that in the both areas, the most, um, the compound that ha has a high, uh, highest concent mean concentration is APPP. Uh, and in the case of Balearic, it's followed by TMCP and in Catalan coast for DCP. Okay, here we, we compare the, the diet plastics and turtles from Balearic coast uh, with the uh, OPs uh, abundance. Here we can see that the, in diet, we found uh, 16 out of 19 OPs, and uh, the most common compound is TBOEP. We found that in the all samples. Um, and it's following by these four that the, the, that are found in 80% um, in, um, of, of samples. The highest mean value is for um, APPP. This is a high um, value uh, to, to 145 nanograms grams wet weight. In plastics case, we only found uh, 13 compounds and um, eight of that were uh, detected in, in all samples. And the, the highest value mean was for TDCLPP. In other time, for the turtles of Mediterranean Sea, we found uh, 15 out uh, 19 uh, OPs, and the, the most common was DCP. And here we can see that the, another time the, the, the most, uh, the, high, the highest mean value was for a PPP, uh, like uh, uh, diet samples. 
would mean all of that? Uh, in conclusion, uh, we can see that the Balearic coast turtles seems to to be more polluted than the ones from Catalan coast. Uh, the means are not signif significantly uh, equal at the dispersion of results. is higher in the Balearic coast turtle than in the Catalan ones. Moreover, uh, observating the results, three of these are compounds, it seems that they can be biomagnificated because the concentration of opis uh, are one order uh, of magnitude higher the, uh, than found in prey samples. Uh, however, we need more studies to, to say that there are bioaccumulation bio and biomagnification factors in these compounds. The results uh, in this study suggest that the turtles do not seem to acquire the OPs directly from the prey. It uh, looked like a mixture uh, of sources and also metabolizations. And finally, we can see that the TCP appears in diet and in some plastics, but no in turtles. And the TPP appears in half of plastics in a lot of turtles, but not in prey. The TBOEP um, not found in prey, but appears in, um, on, in most of turtles in uh, low level, levels in plastics. Um, but in this case, um, however, um, more studies are needed to determine the exactly sources of each OP's congeners in marine animals. I'm sorry, these are the references that I used to, to do this presentation. And thank you very much, and if you have a question, thank you. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. There are some, question in, some questions in the room. Yeah, we have one. Yeah, hi. Um, one little question. Um, uh, uh, it's not my field, but I wonder um, why this study is performed in turtles. Is there a specific uh, reason, or I don't know? <laughs> no. uh, it's in turtles because um, we did this kind of a study also in whales and in dolphins, and this, these are um, in this case we had uh, samples of the prey and, and turtles, and also of the plastics in the same zone, and we thought that was uh, interesting to study all the all the the, the situation. But it's, it's because these these kind of animals are in the high level of the um, the food web. Some other, yeah, we have another one. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, do you have uh, a registration of each turtle that you that you sample, that you take for sample, or and do you know the path of each turtle? Because it could be that this uh, goes from the Balearic coast to the Catalan coast or or opposite. Um. Okay, th this kind of turtles um, um, are in the mm, different places, depends on the, uh, in the um, period of the life cycle, okay? And uh, we, we, we don't know exactly the, the situation, but these, these turtles are the same uh, species, but are, um, they have, for example, different diet because they live in, in, in different places. But well, in this case, we don't know if these, um, the, if these turtles uh, went to the, uh, the, um, the north or the south, we, we don't know that. But um, we know that there are uh, adults, and in this case, they are on the coast. And, but w w we have to, to investigate more in, 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 this, in this way. Perfect. I have also a curiosity. Uh, there, do you know that if there is some reference or some bibliography uh, um, about the, the levels of these plasticizers? I mean, do you know if these plasticizers in the turtles are safe or if they are very high or is quite low? low? Okay, yeah, we need more studies of this of these kind of, of plasticizers, of uh, OPs, and normally, um, 
there are no vanit, but we found a lot of, of, of uh, OPs. And uh, the levels are, for example, in dolphins are higher than, than turtles. In this case, it's not um, uh, high uh, levels, but uh, if, if we... Um, if we can see that th there are big accumulation of, or biomagnification, we have a problem in this case because they are toxic. And w we need more studies in, in, in this way, I think so. Thank you. There are some more questions? Okay. Thank you, Berta. <laughs> so now, Jesus Jus Diaz is going to, to, to talk about lensing effect of black carbon particles by secondary organic aerosols. And sulfates. Okay, so no worries. <laughs> Too long for a title. Okay, so I'm Jesus, as he mentioned, and I am from the EGAR group, uh, directed by Chavez Carol. And I'm going to talk about uh, yeah, the lensing effect uh, of secondary aerosols and sulfates on black carbon particles. Okay, so first I will introduce a little bit the problematic and uh, different, uh, different uh, why it matters. Then I will set a bit of a theoretical frames for us to understand how, how this is happening so that we can understand it, not just assume it. And then describe the methodology we have employed and some preliminary results and the conclusions we have obtained and further and deeper research that we can do to better understand uh, this lensing effect. So, uh, oh, this wasn't supposed to happen. So, okay, uh, important. Black carbon is the second most important warming agent on climate after CO2 gas. So, very important under current climate warming crisis. Um, it is produced as a result of the incomplete combustions of uh, fossil fuels, biofuels, biomass, and it's mainly due to the diesel engines, uh, cookstoves, burning, including the forest fire that we are seeing now in California, for example. Um, it's characterized by the very short lifetime, uh, uh, so the lifetime. So any decrease. Uh, we have a huge, a fast response on its impact on the uh, direct radiative effect. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, for the projected uh, temperature for the future by climate models, if there is no em uh, emission, emission restriction, then the, 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 there's a, a very scary uh, increase in linear line curve. But if we take measures with CO2 and then we also take measures with uh, methane, which is also very self life uh, gas, and black carbon, which is not uh, currently, um, uh, there's any directive for controlling it, just yes, indirectly by mass particle mass. Uh, so, oh yeah, it's crucial to, the, to, to understand the absorption which dictates the variative uh, effect on climate. So that's what we are going to do. Um, so okay, uh, set a little bit of a theoretical frame. So yeah, as we mentioned, BC is the um, highest, most efficient uh, absorbing particles. It's too, it's too close, right? Okay. Yeah, because if not, I don't hear myself. Uh, so why black carbon is so efficient? Well, it's mainly due to the fact that its, compo its composition is uh, that of a uh, graphite-like uh, crystalline structure, which is uh, that of, uh, it forms a hexagonal structure with, sorry, with three electrons, and then there is a, a remaining uh, free electron, which is in the p-plane, which is free to roam, and this roaming means uh, absorbing uh, radiation from, from the ultraviolet to the near infrared, so it has the ability to absorb a lot of energy. So apart from that, which is also which is quite something, then we have uh, an inconvenient, which is the fact that some other aerosol particles can internally mix with this particle in a process that is called coating, that it coats the particle and then it focuses uh, light into the into the black carbon core, therefore increasing its absorption efficiency, and that is not currently taken into the climate models because it's uh, very regional, it's like 
uh, where the emissions ha take place, then this happens. So further studies uh, need to be done because some studies show that there is almost no lensing effect, other studies show that there is a huge lensing effect. So uh, deeper and further analysis of this effect needs to be done, and that's what we do here in Barcelona. Uh, so yeah, it introduces large errors. So how we have done this? Okay, first of all, uh, what is uh, elemental carbon or black carbon? They almost seem the same, but they are not. And it's mainly due to the methodology to that we have measured the carbon, the black carbon. So elemental carbon is m measured via thermal uh, me measurements in which we heat the sample. So any uh, thing that is not pure carbon is evaporated and then we measure the, the mass of the, of the carbon. And then black carbon is measured via optical methods in which we interact the sample of the air with uh, radiation and then we measure the absorption. And um, both EC and BC are related, well, the measurements of this methodology, so the concentration of the, black, the, the carbon and then the absorption of the carbon are correlated by the mass absorption cross-section of the black carbon, which is the efficiency of, uh, of the, like every gram to absorb energy, right? So um, then we have the absorption enhancement, this lensing effect, in which we, ha we can see the observed mass absorption cross-section by the measurements we have taken uh, carry out, divided by the theoretical uncoated uh, mass absorption cross-section of black carbon. So this is uh, being studied theoretically and it's thought it's been said that it's uh, 7.5 or 550, so whatever, right? But uh, since we, we don't measure, um, we will extrapolate this to 890 nanometers, which is more in the infrared. So it doesn't interact. So we are just measuring internal mixing because there are other things going on at shorter wavelengths. And then, so yeah, we extrapolate and we measure. Okay, so which compounds can create a coating over the BC particles, both inorganic, like sulfate, and organic compounds, like uh, bracken carbon, which affects more in the shorter wavelengths, and organic aerosols. So as I said, very high mm, de mm, sensitivity on the site, uh, de dependency, like a it varies a lot. And then the instrumentation we have uh, employed is uh, ACSM, which I think she presented uh, yesterday, Marta, my mate, um, from the office, uh, which uh, is able to do chemical speciation of PM1 particles. So it is able to determine sulfate, nitrate, and organic matter, both pri primary and secondary, as well as uh, eth ethalometer A33, which is able to measure the absorption of the black carbon. Uh, sunset OCSE online, which is able to measure the uh, concentration of uh, elemental carbon. So with all this, we can actually measure the lensing effect and the enhancement of absorption. Oh. Okay, so some preliminary results on the coating influence on the mass absorption cross section. So here we have the OCEC ratio, which um, determines, uh, so the higher the OCEC ratio, the more coating there is in the black carbon particles. Okay, so we see that uh, with an increasing OCEC ratio, it is with an increasing uh, coating, we've got uh, an increased uh, observed mark. So obviously coating influences the max. So there is an uh, absorption enhancement. And after, as we will see later, it's mainly due to the secondary organic aerosols. Okay, so um, now we take into account the ACSM data, which uh, gives us the speciation. And as I quite sure she presented yesterday. So in Barcelona, we have mainly traffic related, which is the HOR, biomass burning organic aerosols, which are boot stuff and so on. Um, and then we got some for secondary and some more oxidized organic aerosols, so very low lead aerosols which get oxidized uh, due to chemical uh, process in the atmosphere and less oxidized, which is more or less the same, but with less time. Then we've got the sulfates and the nitrates and the cooking-like organic aerosols, which are due to cooking. So if we do a multivariate linear regression of all these, um, we can obtain the, the contribution of each compound to the absorption of the, to enhancement absorption, or the enhancement of the absorption. So that's what we do. And we have shown that the highest contribution 
is due to the sulfates. Well, the highest is from the more oxidized organic aerosols. So it's um, natural to think that the more uh, time it is a particle in the atmosphere, the higher possibility for it to coat. So yeah. And then the sulfates, which is a very white uh, in a scattering in a, a particle, which if it coats, is very efficient at uh, lensing the, the light into the black carbon core. So th they are the most uh, efficient, so that is mainly due to the secondary organic aerosols. So now we do, so as we can see for both graphs, figures, the absorption enhancement increases with an increase of concentration of the sulfate and the MOA, as we expected. So that's, uh, that's not good, but that's good to know. So that's the basic of uh, the base of our study. And then we would like to study further this uh, effect of aging, like the time a particle is in the atmosphere. And so it ages. And then how this affect the absorption enhancement. And for doing that, we will use uh, some factors from the ACSM results. And yeah, a study with a scatter plus of some factors, uh, how it ages the 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 particle and its effects on the absorption enhancement. So yeah, as a um, conclusion, there is lensing absorption enhancement here in Barcelona, it's happening. Uh, and the main sources are related to the MOA and the sulfates. And that the relative importance of each sources uh, on the content, on the coating changes as a function of the measurement site. So in um, other studies like Sang et al, which is published in Nature uh, Science, I think, uh, it was done for Paris, and then they found that um, the coating was only due to the more oxidized organic aerosol. Um, but here we also find a high uh, contribution of the sulfates, which could be due to the fact that we've got a port, uh, um, a vessel port, so and the shipping emissions uh, contain a lot of sulfates, so they are may probably affecting the, the characteristics of the aging of the particles here in Barcelona, and hence the coating. So, uh, Further steps needs to be done on this, but yeah, more or less this is all. So, any question? Thank you so much for your nice pres presentation, Jesus. There are some questions in the room. <laughs> of course. Um, I was wondering, you said that this relationship between more oxidized and sulfate um, can depend on the site or highly depends on the site. Do you think there could be a relation also with seasons or temperature? So, yeah, um, as, as you saw yesterday, uh, the more oxidized and the SOA, well, the SOA concentration varies uh, seasonally mainly due to the fact that um, the more sun availability, availability like uh, uh, the, the aging uh, increases with the increased number of photons in the atmosphere, which are, um, uh, it uh, creates box and so compounds that can accelerate the, co the, the, the coating. So yeah, there the definitely is a seasonality and um, because the concentration of the different coating uh, compounds will will change, and therefore it will change. So we, yeah, we we also studied. We have some preliminary results about that, about that, but uh, we thought that it would be too much to show. <laughs> Thank you. Some other questions? There are no questions in the Facebook Live. So thank you so much, Jesus. So thank you so much for attending this day to the presentations. And with that, we are closing the sixth session of oral presentations. Uh, we need to, to remember you that tomorrow at 12 p.m. we are going to announce the awards uh, for both oral and poster presentations. Uh, I hope you enjoy this this week and thank you so much